Mark Glass, and you're listening to It's All About Food. I am here with Chef Ramses Bravo, and he has a cookbook out, Bravo Express. And I'm really looking forward to digging into this one because I loved his previous cookbook, which was called... Bravo Cookbook. Bravo Cookbook. What a great name you have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to It's All About Food. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. The big thing behind what you do and these recipes that you create that would probably stun so many people. Not only are they vegan, but they are SOS free. Correct. So let's focus on that. SOS free. What the term means is that food cooked without any added salt, oil, or sugar. You know, natural sugar occurring in a apple or, you know, natural oil in an avocado is fine, but nothing that comes from a box or a bottle added to the food. There's like a whole line, a timeline, or people who are used to certain kinds of food. So the whole vegan thing is finally mainstream. We have lots of wonderful restaurants all around the world that offer all kinds of delicious gourmet vegan food. It's quite a cuisine. And yet this goes even further, being oil, salt, and sugar-free. So yeah. people already are like, you're a vegan, what do you eat? And now, what? No oil, no sugar, no salt. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, not only is it good for us, but it can be incredibly delicious. That is correct. Right? Yep. Okay, let's back up a little bit. You have a great story. You've been working for over a decade now with True North, which is Northern California, Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, we're about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. That's Dr. Alan Goldhammer's organization. Correct. And it's like a fasting retreat and people can learn about healthy food. We call ourselves a vegan wellness center. Vegan uh, wellness center. I like that. So essentially we're a hotel. People come in, they check in, they get a room, and then for the duration of their stay, we feed them you know, very healthy, very delicious food. If they decide to take part of our fasting program, then they go on a water-only fast for however many days that they you know, agree with with the doctors. When people are here, we have uh, cooking demonstrations, uh, lectures by the doctors, there's yoga, there is meditation, just like talks and lectures. There's lots to do. Yeah. And it's all surrounded by healthy food. And I wish, as you said, it's like a vegan hotel, but I wish there were a lot more hotels that offered food like you offer. But you didn't plan on working at this place when you first started out. This was really far away from your radar. Yeah, the, this was not the dream when I first decided I wanted to be a chef. I didn't know what vegan was until I was probably 18, you know, graduating high school. And when I learned the word, I'm like, what does that mean? And then somebody told me, I was like, oh, why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> so this was definitely not the dream. It was not on the radar. But, you know, the way life happens, you know, I've been here in September. I'll be here 13 years. Wow. Well, now that you've been there and it's been good to you, not just as a job, but for your own health, because you ended up losing a lot of weight. Correct. Is it in hindsight? Is it the dream? Oh, maybe not. I don't know. I, I've, I've actually never been asked that question, so I never thought about it. I really enjoy working here, being the chef here. I've done mm -hmm. a lot of uh, great projects, and I've gotten to meet a lot of great people and just go to different places you know, around the U.S. because of my job. I have a great staff that works for me, and then the other employees you know, in the other departments I like. I made some good friendships and we work hard you know it's not yes. you know paradise we work very hard it also the job itself allows me to be creative outside of work i've had time to work on photography and writing all in all you know between the not just for the body health but also for the mind it's been a really good well good you place. may not realize it but you have are really doing some groundbreaking work it's groundbreaking very few people are doing this Yes, very few. And when people learn to be a chef, there should be a portion of it that says the food that you present should not only be delicious and beautiful, but should be nourishing. And that's left out of chef training for the most part. Yes, oh, yes it is. <laughs> yeah, the that needs to change. To the idea is to make it as delicious as possible. It's but the, look but good delicious, good. delicious is relative. That's true. I've been a vegan for 32 years, vegetarian for longer. I 
lived and eaten all around the world and my tastes have changed. Something that I would have really loved, like a simple pasta with oil and garlic, is now oily. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good thing, you know, you can, if you give this a, a long enough try, you can start tasting the difference where you might have liked, you know, a really, you know, like you said, a pasta with lots of olive oil and lots of garlic and, and the oil itself is the sauce. And then if, you know, you eat this way for a couple of weeks and then you eat that pasta again, you're like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so I have a bunch of questions. Absolutely. There's a number of things I notice when you're not using oil, sugar, and salt you need to come up with other ways to bring the flavor out of food and give the food flavor. I noticed two things. With most of your soups, you have a blending step where you're blending either all of it or some of it, you might leave it chunky. But blending has a way of giving a soup more flavor. How is that? And is that why you do the blending? Uh, no, actually the, the, the blending is more for a texture kind of a thing for me. I think between my two books, there's probably half and half or at least 60, 40 uh, for those that get blended and those that don't. As far as soup goes, what really gives uh, soups flavor is letting it sit, you know, overnight and giving yes. it a 24 hour resting period. Yeah, that definitely that's helps. What, that's yeah. what really gives it a lot of flavor. And then for us, because again, we do the SOS free, we make our own vegetable broth. So we actually cook our soups with a flavorful liquid rather than water. Because if I was cooking with just water, nobody would like this food. You know, it'd be, it'd be way too bland. In the beginning of the book, you give some really basic information for people which a lot of people need because they know nothing about cooking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when you're cooking your grains, you're always using vegetable broth. Correct. Now, when I cook a grain, I use water. and I don't always use vegetable broth, but when I do, it definitely makes it tastier. It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference, even without salt. Yep. You mentioned in the book that a lot of people who come to True North they love the experience, they love the food, and then you see them panicking as they're going home because they don't know how to do this themselves. And that was one of the reasons you did, you wanted to create this book. You said that there are cooking demos at True North. Correct. But it's still not enough. So what happens is, you know, because we're a hotel and we take care of everything, you know, when somebody makes a big investment in themselves and they want to make this big change, you know, change their their lifestyle and their diet, it's really nice to just get up and like, oh, the food is here. Let me just grab whatever I want. But then, you know, two weeks later, people decide time to go home and, oh, food's not going to be prepared and ready to go when I get home, you know, unless I do it myself. So that's a big hurdle for people. So what we try to do is to give people as much information and as much education as to how to be able to do the prep at home and how to cook flavorful meals that are not complicated. And so that's, you know, that's our goal. Best as we can, we give people as much information. There are food demos by multiple instructors here. Although it's a little bit, it's different right now with the current, you know, the COVID situations, everybody's doing streaming demos and lectures. Is not as good as when you're right there looking at the food. That's true. Is, is True North open right now? It is. We're open. Okay. Um, we've just adjusted to the situation. And so between, you know, the book and I also have a, uh, an online cooking course, that's, you know, a way for people to, when they go home, like, you're going to be fine. You know, <laughs> you got the book, got the recipes, check out the course, you know, it'll give you step by step. Before this whole COVID-19, I also did a, I taught some uh, hands-on cooking classes for people here. So, you know, we were, we try to do the best we can to, you know, send people home with all the tools they need. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you it, all this month, I've been talking to a number of cookbook authors, book pub cookbook authors, uh -huh. that I thought would be helpful to people who are sheltering in place and have to cook more at home. And I wanted to offer the cookbooks that I think are not only healthy, but delicious. So this is the last one I'm featuring this month. Another thing you mentioned was the toasting of the spice. Now, I know I've read lots of cookbooks and heard people talking about cooking, especially when it comes to Indian cuisine, where there's mm -hmm. lots of spices. There's always this pre-step of toasting the spice, but usually it's in oil or right. often it's in oil. You're telling us that we just need to toast the spice 
to get the flavor, we don't need to add oil. Correct. So here's how it works. When you buy a container of spice, you know, say if you, men you mentioned Indian cooking, so like a Indian curry spice, you buy that at the grocery store and you bring it home. If you make a dish and then sort of sprinkle it at the end, you're probably going to get about 50% of flavor out of that. When you toast it, the flavor increases, you know, easily, but to like 80, 80 plus percent of flavor just by toasting it, which means you put that spice in a, in a pan or pot, you turn that pot on and you stir it for a while. And then you're able to smell the spice because, you know, as it heats up and as it get, you starts to toast, all the flavors sort of wake up and then the aromas come out and just all the flavor starts to come out. Now in regular Indian cooking, what they do is they, they start with the oil and the first thing they, they do for a lot of dishes is they, they throw the spice in. So they're sort of frying it in there. By toasting it, you don't get as much flavor necessarily out of that spice, but because we don't use any oil, we're also not blocking the taste buds from tasting the food as we would normally. So anytime you you cook with oil, whether it's in a dressing or a stir fry, you put a you know spoonful of whatever dish it is and it has oil. The oil sort of goes like a, a blanket over your taste buds. And now the flavors don't register as well. When that happens, you bind yourself to having to use salt in order for the, the flavor to register. So if you remove the oil from the food, you remove the need for you know all the salt that you normally would. So between the, the toasting of the spices and not using oil, we can get a pretty good amount of flavor out of spices. You talk about that in the book, and I'm glad you brought it up, this oil coating the tongue and limiting how much flavor we can get when our tongue is coated with oil. It makes so much sense. And yet there's a lot of belief that we need oil and salt to make food tastier. But right. it's the combination. That's right. Um, but that you know, most of that comes from the fact that it's been done that way for generation after generation, centuries after centuries. So everybody just goes, okay, well, when you cook, you have to have oil and you heat it up and then you know you cook the food and then you add a bunch of salt. Wrong. Uh, you know, the way my mom did it and my grandmother and you know her mother and her mother and her mother. And so it's the sort of uh, accepted truth that, that has to be, that is yes. the way to do a it. A tradition. Tradition. A tradition. All right. Now, you know, you get enough, a few enough of, a few of us out there who are like, well, you know, you can do it that way, but here's a very different way uh, that still makes it very flavorful, but much healthier. When I look through a cookbook and when I'm reviewing, when I read everything, I look for something that I'm going to get out of it, what I'm learning. I cook very similarly to the recipes you have in the book but there was something that I can't wait to make, and uh -huh. that's the lentil crepes. Oh yeah, that's a big, those are a big hit. Make so, some today, actually. I make a lot of crepes. I make buckwheat crepes, I make garbanzo bean flour crepes, and a bunch of other mixes that I've put together, and I was thinking I needed to get lentil flour, but now I'm, I read from your recipes that you just soak them for an hour and then blend them, and then you, Season it up and you have a batter. Yeah, that's, that's it. genius. It's very simple. Yeah. And is that how they're typically done? Lentil crepes in traditional places? Like I've had them in Indian restaurants, lentil crepes. I've had the lentil right. cracker. Yeah, so yeah. I learned this sort of trick from, uh, from an Indian chef over at his place one time. He's like, oh, you know, we're going to make some lentil crepes. And he told me the ingredients and he told me it's a crepe. And then I thought, well, maybe he means something else because a crepe is very different than what he's talking about. Lo and behold, they, they look and act just regular egg flour and butter kind of crepe. And I thought, oh my God, this is you know a total game changer because now I can have crepes again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely um, so gonna I do can... that. You've got sweet and savory for these sweet lentil crepes yeah. too. Correct. So, you know, the, the process is pretty much the same. You soak the lentils for an hour and then you drain them, put them in the, in the blender and you add the, the liquid you're going to use and the spices. It could either be sweet spices or savory spices. So it works either way. Now in the book, you've said yellow or red split lentils. 
Does Correct. it work with other lentils? Have you tried other lentils? I've tried mung beans, split mung beans. I've also tried chana dal, which is a small split garbanzos. And so the trick is, as long as your legume is split, so the membrane, the outer membrane has been removed, you're good to go. Mm. Uh, because what happens is, once that membrane is removed, you're soaking the lentils. The water can get in there and they can soak up and get nice and soft so that when you blend them, the batter is not grain. Right. Okay. I'm very excited about this. So thank you for putting that in your book. That's definitely happening like in the next day or two. I'm just wondering, you work really hard. You make all of these wonderful dishes at True North and you help a lot of people. I'm thinking about what you eat or what you like to eat. We have these images from films about food, for example, or interviews, and you see the chefs and the cooks and they're all working hard in the kitchen. And then when they're all done, they're all sitting together around a table and they're usually eating pasta. Yeah, simple stuff. <laughs> simple. And so what do you do when you're all done? I usually, you know, after a day's work, I take some of the food that we prepared here and I take it home. It's not that I don't like it, but I, I rarely cook at home because cooked all day, I want to go home and, you know, do something else, relax. And then also when I go home, I don't have a dishwasher, you know, like I do here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you haven't no, trained just, your kids to be the dishwasher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I dog-eared a few recipes that stood out to me, like the pan-roasted zucchini and carrot balls, mm -hmm. where you have to use a melon baller rather than chopping the zucchini and the carrots. You don't have to. You can chop it up. But what happens is when you use a, a melon baller and you make them into this, in the little balls, they roll around in the pan a lot easier. <laughs> so they cook more evenly and, you know, Plus, you know, having round shaped uh, food is, it's different. It's different. It's fun. And you could always use the leftovers for vegetable broth, right? You can always, you know, make a puree out of them or you make them into, you know, put it in the broth. So um, zucchini is softer than a carrot. Is it, is it hard to ball a carrot? <laughs> or a little bit tougher, you know, when you're using the, the baller. But if you, once you use them, they're small enough so that they cook pretty much at the same time. Oh, no, I'm just wondering about when you're actually making the rounds out of a carrot. Uh, it is a little bit harder to do it from the carrots thing than it is from the zucchini. Yes. Yeah, I could definitely see doing it with the zucchini. That sounds like a lot of fun. You're just introducing people to a lot of different vegetables that they wouldn't normally make. I'm glad you have a red curry squash recipe. It's not always easy to find a red curry squash, but they're gorgeous. They are, and they're delicious. They are gorgeous and delicious and uh, great to roast and stuff and just have fun with. At True North, are there any favorites of all the things that you make? The crepes are always a big hit. There's never enough of them. There is the, the lasagna recipe from the first book. That's always the big, a big crowd pleaser. From the Bravo Express, the uh, lemon parsley dressing goes pretty quick. Mm. The truffles, the blueberry lime truffles are always a big hit here as well. I want to talk about the sweets at the end, the comfort foods, the sweets. You're saying that there is sugar in these recipes, not refined sugar, but sugar. It's really, yeah. as I look through, you're using fruit juice, which is sweet. Are you allowed to do that at True North? Yeah. Fruit juice is a great way to sweeten food. It's almost a whole food, but it doesn't have the fiber. And there's actually been some interesting studies about fruit and fruit juice. And some will say that fruit juice is too sugary, but other reports have shown that it's, it's still healthy. When we have it as a treat, it's perfectly fine. So my thought process on that is the idea is to maintain this diet as much as possible. You know, we're not asking anybody to be, you know, perfect angels or anything like that. But we're trying to make a diet and with different dishes that people will always be satisfied with. We do use the fruit juices so that we can make some desserts where people go, wow, this is really good. You know, I actually don't miss the whipped cream, the creme brulee, the, you know, the frosting, because this is actually really good. Yes, there are some of those people out there who say, well, you know, a fruit juice has, you know, the fiber has been removed and it's too sugary. But the alternative to that would be making a dessert, which 
you know, wouldn't satisfy people and they'd be, well, you know, this is okay. Maybe I'll just have a little slice of cake. The idea is to maintain, try to keep people on the diet as much as possible. As, as a whole. When there's fiber in food and there's fiber in all of your treats and all of your recipes, that fruit juice is going to be digested differently than if there was no fiber at all. Oh, correct. There, there's so much fiber in you know, all the dishes that we make. We're, we're not lacking fiber at right. all. Right. And that's, that's the difference. Even in your book, you even talk about people who still ask, where do you get your protein? But the real question is, where do you get your fiber? Where do you get your fiber? Yeah. That is the that is a hundred times more important. Yes, thanks for putting that in, in there. Okay, so Chef Bravo. Bravo! <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today and for this cookbook. Is there anything you want to add before we go? Yeah, the book was published about a year and a half ago. And then a year later, I put together a website, bravopb.com, where people can find my online cooking course, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And a lot of the dishes that are cooked in the course and presented are from the Bravo Express and some of, as well from the uh, Bravo Cookbook. It is a uh, one-time $20 payment for lifetime access. Wow. So it's a really good deal. And the, my idea with it was to make this information available and affordable for everybody. Most that everybody is a very, very valuable resource. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Between the book and the course, these interviews that I do where I answer a lot of questions for people, you know, I'm hoping to get a lot of information out there for people who want to do the uh, plant-based diet. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me and be well. Okay. Thank you. And there we go. That was my interview with Chef Ramses Bravo, author of Bravo Express. And now the second part of our show with Gary DiMatte, here hey, we go, Gary. Karen, heart glass, ladies and gentlemen. We're at the end of June 2020. Yes, June 2020. Still here at Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters. We are, we're still here. We're and still here. Talking about Ramses Bravo. That sounds like a name you would give a lucha libre, a luchador. You know, the Mexican wrestlers? Yeah. Remember Ramses in the movie... Nacho Libre. That poor man passed away. Oh. His name was Silver King was his wrestling name. Yeah. His real name was Cesar Gonzalez Baron. Cesar Gonzalez Baron, a 51-year-old wrestler known as the Silver King, who was made famous in the movie Nacho Libre, the 2006 movie by Jack Black. And that's one of your favorite movies, yeah. isn't it? And Ramses... Passed away in the ring last year, wrestling. Yeah, a heart attack. That's sad. Very sad. But anyway, we're not talking about no, Ramses the we're wrestler. We're talking about we're Ramses the... Bravo, who has a Ramses wonderful Bravo, last name. Bravo. Who has a great name if he ever wanted to be a luchador. <laughs> if I talk with him again, I'll let him know. <laughs> he could be the luchador chef. You know? There you go. Lucha Libre, and I'll cook you up some salt-free, sugar-free, oil-free food, which is actually very good for you. Very good. I know a lot of people right away when they hear salt-free, sugar-free, oil-free, what's the point? Exactly. Right? It's like going to a Starbucks and getting a decaf, <laughs> low-fat, non-fat. Nothing in nothing it. Nothing in it. It's, you Hot know, beverage water. Otherwise, what's the point? But you can make food without oil, salt, and sugar, and it tastes really, really great. It tastes really great. good, and we do it all every the time. day, all the time. And you're always coming up with new ideas that just blow my palate away. Well, I'm coming up with new ideas to sneak a little bit of oil in there every now and then. Like I have this eyedropper bottle, <laughs> right? And I'll put one eyedropper of oil in a the bottom of a cast iron pan just to season the pan because sometimes cast iron you can get a little rust on it if you don't yeah, season it true. with a little oil i heat it up i season the pan with just like an eyedropper of oil i spread it around you can hardly tell it's even there he's telling the truth he's no i'm using haven't. an eyedropper he's using an old bottle that we had dr Furman's dha purity in if any of you use that product i right. recommend it for DHA and EPA, we keep it Yeah, we could talk about that later. But 
He's reusing an, a dropper and bottle from that, right? Right. With olive I oil. I fill that with olive oil. And once in a while, we make a tofu that we call our tofu masala. And it needs a little tiny bit of oil, just a tiny little drop of oil on each little square of tofu. But you don't have to dip it in oil. You don't have to immerse anything in oil. So there's a real art to getting a little bit of oil in some yeah. food you know, I just think to give it a hint. There's a group of people that condemn using oil, salt, and sugar. And there's great value to that because we live in a world where people use oil, salt, and sugar to the extreme. Right. To be able to focus on preparing food without salt and sugar and oil, then if you need to or you want to, you can subtly add a little bit and it's not going to be detrimental. Right. And we're talking a, a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> Let's talk about why oil isn't so great for you and why there are some alternatives that make your food taste just like you put oil on it. So, for example, you came up with a great elevator speech about what oil does, for example, to your tongue and how it blocks the taste buds and the only thing that cleans it off is salt right the salt dissolves the oil yeah and that's why we're so fixed on oil and uh, you know and literally fixed we're addicted to oil and salt in lots of our food because they're compatible with the thing that you taste after your tongue is coated in yeah. oil is the salt that's the thing that allows you to taste through all of that oil chef bravo talked about it in his cookbook right. i was surprised to see that and we've been made to believe that we need the oil to bring out the flavor in food. And there is some chemistry in there somewhere about aromatics and things and working with oil. But, but manufacturers a of, give and take. of snacks, for example, have laboratories where people are working in lab coats on how the taste can be addictive. And it usually involves salt and oil. And a little sugar. You know, I'm sure those are really wonderful, smart scientists in there, but I can't help but think those are mad scientists kind of laboratories. Yeah, there are food companies that hire scientists and they pay them to bring out a taste in a product, a, a snack product that will create an addiction. You'll want yeah. more and more. Doritos, for example, they work tirelessly on making Thank their you. different Doritos. I mean, when they say it's not Doritos, but... What is it? Lay's potato chips? You can't eat just one? You can't eat just one. And they know what they're talking about there. Because they really have worked behind the scenes to create this thing that we just buy a bag of Doritos and open it up and start munching on it. And right away we want more and we want to dip it in other substances that have salt and sugar and fat and, you know, dips and different things. And it's marketed to a group of people who are going to be looking at this like it's, it's compatible with a football game or any celebration. And right away, you're connecting all of the romanticism involved in food that we oftentimes connect with, which is why it's so difficult to kick dairy, for example, because, you know, you relate it to when you were a child and your parents fed you all of these wonderful little cheese sticks. And it and came with love. Those foods came, came with love. Yeah, so when you're when you're presenting those foods that are filled with salt and sugar and, and fat to your children and you're presenting them with love and, and laughter and, and family um, good times and all of that, it's going to stick with you. And no wonder it's so difficult to kick. It's difficult for that reason, but it's something that takes time too. We live in a society that wants everything fast, wants a quick fix. Changes in your lifestyle and diet, for some people can be quick, but for a lot of people, there's a learning curve and it takes time. And if you put on a lot of weight, for example, it takes time to healthfully take it all off. Hallelujah. But Amen to that one. We're constantly learning here and we're constantly changing and evolving and we're kind of in a new place. Right. Even though we've been eating healthfully for a long time. The chips are stacked against us. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's my clever take on this. And end of the conversation about how Doritos and other chips can be addicting because... What do you do when the chips are down? Now there are the scientists behind these products that are creating them so that it's very difficult for us not to want them because they want us to buy their product. The deck is stacked against us. So programs like this one, where you actually can make flavorful, wonderful food without salt, sugar, and fat, are really valuable. 
valuable to people who want to kick these products that are making them sick. And we want you to know you're not alone. And you're not alone. How do we do it? How do we cook without salt, sugar, and fat here at Responsible Eating and Living and still make it tasty and delicious? Well, it's not that we don't use fat, because we use fat in a lot of our food, but it's the good fats. It's fat from whole foods like cashews and walnuts and almonds Raw nuts and seeds. Raw nuts and seeds. And dressings made with a powerful blender that blends those nuts up and they become your fat. You just replace processed oils with whole foods like raw nuts and seeds. I want to interject here. This is not a commercial. We don't make any money from selling Vitamix appliances. No. But a long time ago, I didn't want to get a Vitamix because I didn't want another appliance on the counter I believed in a small, in a sensible, reasonably priced blender. But finally, we got a refurbished Vitamix, and it was donated to our nonprofit. So you didn't buy a Vitamix. I didn't, but I ended up buying other Vitamixes subsequently for my right. mom, and also we got... Oh, you've bought a lot of Vitamixes since then, but... We also the... bought at the other container for the Vitamix. But the very first Vitamix you purchased was not a purchase. It was a donation by Vitamix to our nonprofit, yes. Responsibility and Living. Thank you, Vitamix. But we use it... Every day. Not only every day, we use it multiple times. Everything goes in the Vitamix. And it really is important to have the right tools if you want to cook without processed oils, sugars, yeah. and fat. So my point is a high-powered blender is really worth it. Yes. It will make life a lot easier and open your world to right. more options. Exactly. And there are oil-free versions, vegan versions, of all of the things that are now out there on the market as well, which are things like mayo, for example. There's an oil-free mayo. It's not a fat-free mayo. There's an oil-free mayo recipe in Miyoko's Pantry, for example, the book that we talk about on this show all the time. But there are other recipes out there where you use cashews, raw cashews, as your base. Throw a little tofu in there or a little okara. I made a mayo the other day. Okara. Okara. <laughs> okara. No, I made a mayo the other day for my okara. Okara. My okara no tuna salad that we make with okara and a oil-free mayo that's made with cashews, you would have never known the difference. Oh my God, it was so good. Wasn't it great? It's going so in our good. cookbook. Going in the cookbook. Yeah, our cookbook's in, in the works and it's going in the cookbook. So, and hey, it's about time after almost 10 years now with Responsible Eating yes. and Living. It's going to be our 10th 10 10 year anniversary, anniversary cookbook. cookbook. You're going to want to put your order in now for that. It'll be out next year because we launched in July of 2011 and we're coming up to our ninth year. <laughs> In a couple of days, we'll be nine years old. Nine, nine, nine. Nine, nine, nine. Also, how do you get away without using sugar? I mean, I know you've talked about this multiple times on the show. We need to continue discussing it. We use dates. We use fruit to sweeten things. But we also use a little sugar from time to time for special occasions. But, you know, we're finding year after year after year that there's less of a need for sugar. Less of a need. Let me tell you, we have a couple of chocolate bars in the refrigerator that have been there a long time. Right. We bought those at the beginning of the lockdown because we thought, well, you know what? When people are in quarantine, a little chocolate sometimes helps you feel better about things. Yeah, and dark chocolate can be part of a healthy diet. Dark chocolate has a lot of different things in it that yes, are good for you, does. right? We just bought some carob. We're going to get back into carob because I bought a Ticino here at Responsible Eating and Living Headquarters <laughs> for our break room coffee. <laughs> our break room coffee and the Mr. Coffee that's on there isn't coffee. It's uh, Ticino. The water cooler and the coffee maker in the break room have <laughs> Ticino in it. <laughs> and Ticino is a grain coffee. It's made with chicory, I believe, yes. and some other wonderful things. Yes. And they add a little maca in this in particular. One of the flavors. And some carob. Yes. They also add a little chocolate, but they call it caffeine free. So I'm not sure what they're doing to the chocolate or if it's just such a minute amount that there's nothing yeah, in there. But it's good. Anyway. Going to the next part of your talk with Ramses Bravo, he doesn't use any oil and salt or sugar, 
But sautéing without oil, a lot of people really freak out about. They think there is no way you can sauté without oil. And I'm here to say, ah, wrong. <laughs> you can sauté without oil. Use a vegetable stock. I use vegetable stock all the time to sauté. And it works really well. A lot of times you'll see a recipe that'll say, saute your onions and garlic and herbs in oil. And instead of using oil, use some vegetable stock or use water because that'll make a nice flavorful stock all by itself with the onions, garlic, and herbs. Rams has talked about toasting the spices before using them in a dish. And I have to admit, I don't do that. And no, yeah. I think it's time to try because he said you get a lot more flavor out of the spices when you toast them first. Yeah, it's a great idea. And actually put them in a spice grinder after you toast them. Because a lot yeah. of people can't handle the, the chewiness of some of the spices, the bulkiness of the herbs. My idea is to toast them and then put them in a spice grinder. I even put our dry spices in a spice grinder if I'm making sure. soup before I put them in it there. It seems to mix it break like a, it up and enhance it, the flavor. When makes it like a powdery up. bouillon. But here's the other thing I add when I'm sautéing with water. I'll chop a carrot stick and I'll chop a celery stick and some onions and I'll throw that in there. And that makes its own sort of court bouillon right there in the pan. And then I'll add whatever it is I'm sautéing. Vegetables, obviously, most of the time. Occasionally, I'll, I'll sauté some, uh, some rice or something if I'm trying to do like a fried rice thing and I won't, <clears throat> don't want to use oil. There's a lot of really cool ways to work without oil. And again, oil is just, it's not good to ingest. It's just it, fat, no fiber. And when you're using raw nuts and seeds, you're getting the fiber. And it's really difficult. I mean, it's hard. It's hard for people to transition. It's hard for people to say, I'm not going to heat up my saute pan and throw in a couple of tablespoons of olive oil and saute my food before. I mean, that's just difficult. It's tradition. Yeah. It's I, tradition. I see a lot of people using so much oil. Even on food shows. Oh, yeah, watch it, they when... just... And, you know, it's funny because they kind of lie. They'll say, okay, we just use, like, a tablespoon of oil. And you see them pour in a half a cup. There's several ounces of oil in there. <laughs> it was a good show. It's a good book. Go out and buy it. This has been a great series. You've had... Dr. Joel Kahn. Right. And his cookbook, what I was promoting was his discussion of lipoprotein little a... But it came with wonderful recipes. And then Vasanto Molina's cookbook with Brenda Davis, Kick Diabetes Cookbook. So you have three great shows that you did back to back. Vasanto Molina's The Kick Diabetes Cookbook, Joel Kahn, MD, The Lipoprotein, The Heart's Quiet Killer, A Diet and Lifestyle Guide. And now Ramses Bravo's... Bravo Express. Bravo Express. I mean, that's a great title. I know. He can't yeah. lose with a name like that. Yeah. Can we talk about carob? Yeah, let's talk about carob. So what's important to know about carob is it is a unique, independent food with a unique flavor profile and its own nutritional benefits. It is its own special food, and it should not be compared to chocolate or cocoa. And this is an important point because it's not cocoa. It's right. its own individual food with its own lovely flavor profile. And if you're going to have a carob brownie or a carob cupcake or a carob anything and someone tells you it's like chocolate, you are going to be disappointed because it's not. And when you're expecting one thing and you get something else... It's very disappointing. It reminds me of when I used to bite into a pile of mashed turnips, orange turnips, oh, and yeah. think it was sweet potatoes. And I was, as a child, I was so disappointed and I didn't like turnips. Now I've grown up and I love turnips. I appreciate them as their own unique food with their own unique flavor profile. Carob is like that. It has right. a wonderful, warm, fruity, rich flavor. But it's not cocoa. It's not cocoa, folks. You're not going to get that chocolate fix eating carob. Some say you will, no, but... No, it's not. It's just brown. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about another thing. It's summer. We're going into the, the heat of summer now. The deep heat of summer. And people are going to be wanting to have cool drinks mm. and refreshing mm -hmm. sweet things like ice creams and definitely things of that nature what do people do 
that are trying to kick sugar when they want something like ice cream. What do we do here at Responsible Eating and Living? We freeze bananas. And I know you know that they're out there. I know you know bananas are there in the grocery store. At your front door when you order your food online. Try it. If you haven't had a frozen banana in a while, I had one last night and I thought it was the greatest. Just a plain frozen banana. Just a plain frozen banana. Sure, you could sprinkle a little chopped nuts on it and drizzle a little chocolate, maybe one one or two squares of your dark chocolate, put it over the banana. Or, you know what I like to do is I like to make a little peanut butter cream and use that as a dip for my frozen banana. What? Yes. <laughs> You heard me. I dipped my frozen banana in some peanut butter cream, and it's decadent and wonderful. You can get really creative where you melt some chocolate and dip a frozen banana in the melted chocolate and coat it in chopped nuts and then freeze it again. Yeah. I mean, you you could really make these things great. The other thing we like to freeze around here are strawberries and blueberries and all of our fresh berries that we get from our organic Go uh, Organic NYC. Go Organic NYC. Those make great smoothies. You throw them in there, throw them in your Vitamix with some frozen bananas, add a little plant milk, maybe a few dates, some vanilla extract. So good. It's really... So good. I'm going to have to do that after the show. <laughs> we haven't done that in a because few days and it's hot enough now. It's a good frozen dessert that isn't loaded with sugar, but it's loaded with good fruit sugars that are good for you and go right to work and they're give you so, lots of energy. They're so good for you. We need sugar. We need sugar from whole foods, not from refined sources. Our brain thrives on glucose. We need it. And you need get it, it from those those um, smoothies and those frozen yeah. bananas. So and one more thing about the Vitamix versus a blender. If you don't have a Vitamix and you can't afford one or you don't want to get one, whatever, and you have a simple blender, you can still make these wonderful frozen delights but they'll have to be thinner. They'll have to be like a shake, not right. a soft serve. Because a blender needs more liquid to move stuff around and blend it up appropriately. Right. And whatever you do, don't stick a wooden spoon in the blender <laughs> while it's running. <laughs> or a spatula. Because we, before we had a Vitamix, we used a lot of blenders in this house. And I've destroyed a lot of wooden spoons. And what about the plastic spatula that I destroyed? Well, you did that in the Vitamix. I did that in the Vitamix. You blended a spatula. Right. That's how I powerful like, why these did it, things why are. Why does this sound a little funny? Yeah. I looked at this... This concoction you were blending, and I thought, what is that? Is that the spatula? Yeah. And it was... Womp, womp, Yeah. Womp. Well, there's a lot of little mishaps in the kitchen. Just be careful. The kitchen can be a dangerous place. We have some frozen soft-serve recipes at ResponsibleEatingAndLiving.com if you need to have some guidance in terms of how much of what ingredient you want to add just to get started, because I know some people are not that adventurous and need to know how much of this and how much of that. So we help you with that. But one of my favorites, which we don't do very often, and I'm thinking of those two oranges we have in the refrigerator right now, may need to go into the freezer, because one of my favorites is the creamsicle. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. So we peel oranges, freeze the sections, and then blend them with some cashews and a little vanilla. It's delicious. And it's that it has that creamsicle. Who remembers? Raise your hand. Good humor. Ice cream bars. The creamsicles, which were like an orange sorbet yeah. with vanilla ice cream inside. I'm raising like my hand. I'm raising my hand. And that flavor was so yummy. And all you need is oranges, cashews, and a little vanilla extract, and you get that wonderful mix. Okay. So now that we started with that. Let me then say, some of you out there are going to say, forget that, I'm going to have ice cream. So then my advice to you is buy a vegan ice cream product. And there's a lot of them out there. There's a ton of them. And again, there are oat milk ice creams out there now. There are almond milk ice creams. There are ice creams that are called non-dairy frozen desserts. Because they're suing people in different states <laughs> about calling things ice cream when it's not ice cream. And, and butter when it's not butter. And 100% cheese. plant-based, dairy-free, frozen desserts. There's a ton of them out there. I would like you to try, if you're not a fan of vegan products, try a vegan ice cream. They're delicious. They're decadent, just like the other dairy ice creams. 
and you'll be saving the lives of several dairy cows in the process. Yeah, and there are some reports that just came out. I'm, I have to digest them before I talk about them here because I just saw them this morning. But there's more data that's come out recently about the tremendous impact on the climate industrial dairy farming has. They're contributing a huge amount to greenhouse gases, more than we knew before. And the increase has gone up and has gone up in the last few years. Yeah, so, so go dairy-free, dairy everybody. Is a big no-no. Yeah, so there's a lot of wonderful vegan ice creams out there. But keep in mind, they all have oil, sugar, sugar and, and salt. salt. Believe it or not, they have salt. There are some brands that I really don't like because I can taste the salt in them. Right. And the salt is there to probably melt the oil off of your tongue so you can taste the sugar. I mean... <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's all done in a laboratory, everybody. But if you're ambitious or just have a little time or a little curiosity, you can make your own ice creams without oil, sugar, and salt, either with coconut milk or cashews or any of your favorite plant milks. And, and get some dates. And if you and some dates. If you can't sweeten it with dates, make some of our apricot butter with some Turkish apricots. We have the recipe. That sweetens things up very nicely. And after the first couple of times, it'll be sweeter than you ever ima can ever imagine. But you got to remember that sugar is a powerful, powerful product. It can destroy your taste buds. Sugar is a white powder. White flour. White wheat flour is a white powder. And Susan Thompson will tell you that they can be as addictive or more so than cocaine, especially to people who are wired to be prone to addictions. Sure. And those those coffee creamers. Those coffee creamers. Oh, no, they're crazy. Ugly a lot white of folks powder. are addicted to those things. Yeah. They need coffee creamer, and that's another yeah. white powder. Huh. And I had a chef that I worked with once who used to put coffee creamer and water, he would mix it up and use it as a base for a lot of desserts that he made. Uh, yeah. Instead of milk, he would use coffee creamer because it just had that oil and sugar yeah. and, so and that, all of those chemicals. That's making me think about eating in restaurants or eating food that's yeah. prepared by other people. And this pandemic is making you rethink eating in restaurants. Yeah. How important is that in your life? Does it, and then is, there are many, many entrepreneurs now that because the restaurants have been closed, they've filled the need of people who need to have their food delivered. And they've been making pizzas and baked goods. And a lot of people are doing it, not necessarily legally, especially in New York. We have some pretty strict laws about yeah. making food and selling it. You have to be in a commercial kitchen that has been inspected by the health department. So a lot of people aren't doing that. And there are loopholes where they can say you can have this product with donation. Ah, oh, very that's clever. That's what some of them are doing, yeah. So they're not really selling it, but they are selling it. Anyway, I think the laws are going to have to change to accommodate the new world that we're in. Right. But the question is, what are you comfortable with? Are you comfortable with someone in your building or someone in your neighborhood making food in their home and then delivering it to you? It's certainly nice. Or And are you comfortable with restaurant food? Are you comfortable with a chef making desserts with coffee creamer? No, I mean, the guy used to mix up coffee creamer with water and make, made his own uh, quote-unquote milk out of coffee creamer and would use it in his desserts because he said it made a better tasting product. Now, coffee creamer is loaded with chemicals and horrible things, and this guy used it. So you don't really know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. They tell you they have a menu and it says this is what... How many times have you been to a restaurant where the menu has said this is what it has and when you get it on your plate, you're like, there's nothing remotely close to what was on the menu. Yes. That's it reminds me of my father. They're making it up as they go along. So my, my dad was a really nice guy, except yeah, he when he was. was in a restaurant. And when he was in a restaurant, he became very demanding and... If he read the ingredients or the description of a dish on the menu and then it came and there were items there that weren't listed or there were items missing that were listed. He would send it back. He could be unpleasant. What's that? <laughs> it's yeah. the expression he legendary. would always say. Legendary. Yes. Your dad that? in a restaurant was legendary. <laughs>
but a good man, just not a friend to servers. Again, on the subject of ice cream or non-dairy ice creams, and you were talking about how they put salt in those, there's actually a product by haagen non-dairy chocolate salted fudge truffle. Uh, uh-huh. Chocolate so they're, salted. They they're, advertise it, yeah. The chocolate salted is actually a thing, or salted nut truffle ice cream, sure. or salted this or salted that. Salted chocolate is is now a big thing, and they're actually advertising that. So there you go. You've got the salt, you've got the sugar, and you've got the fat all in one product. You know, I think it has something to do with the cost. Because if you're going to make an ice cream that's made of all coconut, or you're going to make an ice cream that's purely cashew and water, just cashew-based or entirely nut-based with some dates and vanilla, that's enough. It's sweet enough. It's rich enough. But it's expensive. So a lot of these vegan ice creams you see in the stores have oil in them. Yes. So they have to add more sugar and they have to add salt. Yes. So beware. The trifecta. They're now using it as a marketing tool. They're saying, there's salt in this and sugar and fat. Come and get it. And is it Dickensian or something that the initials are SOS? Yes. Salt, oil, sugar. Right. SOS. That's an alert. (laughs) That should raise an eyebrow or two. Salted caramel. That was the thing. Salted caramel is a thing. Is a thing. Yeah. I mean, like, they people are selling salted caramel ice cream now and salted caramels and salt water taffy and all of right. that has always been a thing. So. All right, let's talk about other frozen desserts that may, that are even easier. So right. if you get a ripe melon. A melon. A melon. Scoop it out. Put it in a blender. It doesn't even have to be a Vitamix. It can be a blender. Right. If the melon is ripe, it's soft. Blend it up. And then you can pour it into either ice cube trays or if you have those fun little pop molds, right? you can make a frozen fruit popsicle. Right. That's those great. are really good. Right. I yeah. S- or sometimes I, s- I like to take the cubes and plop them into a drink. And you yes. have these colorful cubes. Yes. You've done a series of, of great colorful drinks. What were those called? And Agua frescas. Agua frescas. You might want to... Post the link to Oh, yeah. Those. I should put them on the homepage. Yeah, those are great this time of year. Yeah, so there's interesting mixes you can do with melons where you mix. You can mix the melon with water, dilute it a little bit. You can add fresh mint to it, a little lemon juice. Makes a beautiful color and a very refreshing drink with no right. sugar. No sugar. And it's coming up on Independence Day, and we have a video that we're going to probably put up on the homepage about our Independence Day barbecue that we do. And a lot of you are probably going to be going out in your backyards or going out on your terraces or going out to the parks with your face masks on and doing a little barbecuing. We have a great Swingin' Gourmets barbecue video, and it's really, I think it's a great piece. I do too, Gary. It's like a documentary. Right. And it shows you how to make some lentil burgers and some different things you could throw on the grill other than animals. We want to uh, ask you not to use any animal products this Independence Day. Oh, you know what's also great? I have two recipes for fruit tarts. And I love them on July 4th because they're red, white, and blue. Right. And one of them is a raw fruit tart, which I personally think I like better. And the other one is a traditional kind of classic They're delicious. French yeah, fruit the classic tart. French fruit tart. The French fruit tart has a pie crust and you can make it as a wheat crust or a gluten-free crust. I give you that option. Pie crust and then it's coated with a thin layer of dark chocolate. Right, that's the classic French way. And then we make a vanilla custard. Right. And I think the recipe is cashew-based, but you could make a lot of different vanilla custards out there that are vegan with plant milks. And then on top, I layer it with lines of strawberries and blueberries yeah so you have the white from the cream and the red and the blue from the strawberries. again it's a treat it's a special occasion thing so there is a little sugar in the custard and there is a little sugar in the chocolate in the chocolate but if you make the raw version it's there, sos free the raw version is a brilliant what was the thrill for me making that recipe was thinking of adding cacao nibs Mm -hmm. to the crust, which was made from raw fruits and nuts. It was genius. Because that gave the chocolatey flavor. Right. It tastes amazing. It's a great great recipe. I'm excited about it. 
Yeah, that's got to go up on the website for this Independence Day coming up. There's a lot of wonderful things going on out there in the world. Uh, I know that the news will tell you otherwise, (laughs) but a lot of people doing some good things to try and make food much more palatable and much healthier. And we are some of those people here at Responsible Eating and Living. We're doing some good work and we're talking about some great things that we want you to consider. Just know that there's a truth out there to what you're putting in your body. And the truth isn't often reflected in the products that you buy. I don't know why people would want to buy food that would harm them. Or feed their children food that would harm them. And they do it so innocently. Innocently. And again, there's this romanticism attached to food that you need to just have a voice out there that is going to say, no, this isn't. You know, we know it's difficult. We know it's difficult difficult because... When you lift that veil, as you like to say, not only do you see the truth about food and you see people's ignorance, but you start to see a lot more about humanity that is not pretty. Right. And it's hard. And I can see where people don't want to see that or feel that. And so they want it's to look easy the other to way. go back. Yeah. So you're brave and you're courageous for wanting to do better and to learn the truth and to share it with the world and make it delicious. Yes, you have to make it delicious because food can be delicious without salt, sugar, and oil. It can be delicious. Well, Gary, I'm really looking forward to making some cool, sweet, fresh treats today. Absolutely. It's going to be a fun day here in... Pandemic headquarters, here at Pandemic headquarters, here on Pandemic headquarters, <laughs> here within Pandemic headquarters. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Well, we're here. We're here all day. And if you have any comments and questions, you can find us at info at realmeals.org. I'm Karen Hartglass. You've been listening to me and Gary DiMattei for another episode of It's All About Food. Thanks so much for being here and caring. Gary. Thanks, PRN. Thanks, Gary Knoll. Thanks, Chef Rumsis Bravo for being a part of the program. And Karen, have have a a delicious delicious week. week.